beliefs. Good afternoon. I'm Candy Abernathy, Dean of the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. We thank you for joining us today as we have an exciting presentation planned for you. We're thrilled to have Bill Gaddle here with us today to discuss the role of AI in space and communications and what it takes to develop an AI enabled workforce. Bill Gaddle is president of space systems for L3 Harris Technology Space and Airborne Systems segment. Space and Airborne Systems covers an extensive portfolio of solutions in intelligence, surveillance, small satellites, electronic warfare, avionics, including carriage and release systems, wireless solutions, and C4I systems. Bill is responsible for the business strategy, financial performance, and successful execution of all programs within the space systems sector. The sector offers complete earth observation, weather, space protection, and intelligence solutions from advanced sensors and payloads, ground processing and information analytics, and leads end-to-end -end small satellite solutions. Previously, Bill was president of Harris Corporation Space and Intelligence Systems segment prior to the company's merger with L3 Technologies, Inc. in June 2019. Bill was also vice president and general manager of Harris National Systems Business Unit that focused on the U.S. intelligence community and the worldwide space market. During his tenure, the segment became the world leader in satellite-hosted payloads. Bill holds a Master of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Florida. In addition, he is a graduate of the Harris Leadership Directions Program at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. He is a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and National Space Council. He is a board member of the Space Foundation, the UF Engineering Dean's Advisory Board, and Astronauts Memorial Foundation. He is also a recipient of the Outstanding Alumnus Award from the University of Florida. With that, I will hand it off to Bill to begin the presentation and discussion. Thanks, Kenny, and again, welcome to everybody, and thanks for joining. I appreciate your interest in space. I am a space geek for many years. I've been in the space industry for over 30 years, and over time, I've, I've watched it evolve, and I think we are at a very pivotal time in the space history. I'm more of a space person than I am an artificial intelligence person, but I'm trying to merge that in today's briefing. So again, thank you, UF. Thank you to Cami for allowing me to have this time with you. Um, I'll talk about both AI and space at the same time because I think it's important that we know the applications. You know, a lot of times AI is a tool. It's a tool that we use to apply to a different domain and space is one of the domains that we're applying it to here. And so as I talk through today and I'll leave it for questions at the end and we can talk about space questions at the end or AI questions at the end, anything that you all would like to talk about. But I wanna make sure that you understand that space is a unique domain in the application of AI. So if you think about where space has been, space has had a very interesting history. You know, I remember back in the Apollo launches in the 1960s, you know, I was a little boy at that time, and I've seen all these transformations take place, but it's put us in a position now that's very unique. And so I thought I'd walk you through a little bit of that. And I will show some slides eventually, and I'll show you a little bit more about what we're doing. But back in 1960s was the Apollo era, right? It was trying to get people and manned space flight to the moon. And as things evolved, what happened in the 70s and 80s is we basically came about with a, if you will, engineers and scientists led exploration of space and space became sort of a, an engineering field. And then the shuttles came. The shuttles came about bringing back manned space flight, going to a space station and those kind of opportunities. But it dramatically changed in space around the year 2000. And that's when commercial businesses started to explore space. What happened in 2000 was commercial companies came on board, people like GOI and Worldview and other companies that were trying to do imagery, communications. You saw direct TV and those kind of satellites start to come on board. And they would basically bet their company at that time that they could overcome the launch cost and they, they progress forward. And so those were a big deal. And that began the commercial transformation of space. And that's what's been happening for the last 20 years. At the same time, GPS came on board. So the, the GPS satellites were, became a big part of our world. And so as you think about this, where you've gotten to today, and I'll share my screen here just to show you what's happening, but space has basically become critical infrastructure for the world. And what happened as space went is this became the land of the billionaires in the 2010s. You saw billionaires start to come in here with Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. And those people have basically infused space with a lot of money. Um, 
and it's also excited the next generation of space professionals. You're starting to look at people really care about space again because we're starting to see it's exciting again. And that has just really transformed things. And the most recent transformation that we're seeing is in the 2020s, and that is, we'll call it space as a warfighting domain. It's basically, space is no longer a peaceful place. It's actually a contested environment. And when you make it a contested environment, it means that you have to know what's going on around you. Space situational awareness becomes important and you have to know how to defend your satellite and your satellites have to be more autonomous. That's where artificial intelligence comes in. So if you look at what we're happening and you look at the left-hand side of the slide, it's touching about every area of our life. So all of what space is doing has really come to fruition in the last decade. You couldn't live your life without a day and without space every day even transactions and financial transactions are controlled through space clocks and space um, capability. If you look on the left-hand side, you get all your weather from space. You get all the environmental things from space, GPS is from space. You get space exploration has now become very, very interesting to people, both deep space as well as can I get to the moon or Mars. And so we're seeing just a, a radical transformation and the emergence of space as really a domain that has just tremendous capability going forward. So it's basically become critical to us. And you can see the consumers on the left, or on the right, sorry, the consumers, it affects people personally with their phones. It affects engineers and scientists. You can see the different companies that are being impacted by this from the commercial companies like XM Sirius Radio all the way through the governments that are using this to support. So I'm gonna go ahead and change gears and basically say, okay, now what's happening when you have this, when you mix it with artificial intelligence, what happens? It's a completely different dynamic in space when you start talking about artificial intelligence. For years and years, space assets were a satellite and they would talk to the ground through one comm link, communications link, and they would get their information and they would control themselves through those links. Those were not very smart. Sometimes we call them bent pipe. Sometimes we call them dumb satellites. It was just, they were objects that basically a pass through. They might collect a piece of information and send it down, but it was very much just a direct connection. Now you have a completely different dynamic. And that new dynamic is bringing a whole different discussion around artificial intelligence. But let me kind of set the reality of where space artificial intelligence is versus the science of artificial intelligence. Because the next decade is basically going to take us from where we're pioneering right now to full implementation. And so I'm going to try to give you a feel for where we are today. And then I'll give you my futurist look of what AI in space looks like going forward. So I'm gonna pause for a second and basically say, you know, space had artificial intelligence as part of the aura of space. You know, many of you might remember you know, Space Odyssey of 2001, where Hal would say things and basically had this intelligence. It was actually smarter than humans. It actually could control humans or you know, better than humans. You could probably recall Star Trek with V'ger where the Voyager satellite goes out and collects all this information, and brings it back. Obviously we're not at that point, but we have seen some very dramatic increases in AI that we're now reusing in space. So if you think about the last two decades, you've seen basically computers beat people at chess. You've seen them basically win at Jeopardy. You've seen all these things, which are fun and entertaining, but the reality is they have set us up for something much bigger. So we all know that computers basically at this point can understand human speech. It can interpret handwriting. It can basically interpret images and they get better and better accuracy. And we are now seeing it emerge with autonomous vehicles. But how does that apply as we go forward in space? But I want to, as you think about that, I want to say, okay, there's a couple common languages that we have. And I know many of you all are artificial intelligence experts and I'm, I know I'm probably repeating things, but I want to use this as the framework by which we can talk about how does it affect space as we go forward. So let's talk about there is basically artificial intelligence is just trying to get machines to mimic what the cognitive behaviors are for humans. And by doing that, they're, they're trying to perceive a reality around them and then they're trying to take action on it. And so as we think about that in space, it's gonna be the same thing. So if you think about artificial intelligence, we call it artificial narrow intelligence. It's basically taking tasks and, auto and making them autonomous and make it behavior like a human. And this is really where the world is today. It's really where space is today. You teach it a set of rules and then a machine executes those rules. That's why we can have things like it plays checkers and it plays chess and it analyzes language and it takes a look at the different things that happen with imagery. 
The next generation would be artificial general intelligence. So that's where it could cross domains, meaning you could do have the same tools using things for space as well as other domains that may be on or terrestrial. So for example, you could use these tools to recognize cars and trucks in space, but you then teach it to actually learn on its own what a bicycle is, a scooter is, a motorcycle, those kind of things. Basically on its own, try to learn different kinds of objects. Um, that's probably, that is not today. We don't have that kind of computing capability today, but it's coming and I would guess within 10 years, we'll start to see that. And then there's the super intelligence, which is what you've seen in the movies, right? It's, it's when the machine actually operates better than the human and it has better memory, it has better ability to learn, it has better retrieval of memory and understanding. It also can start applying values, which is where you get into game theory, right? You put, what is the value you're placing on a decision? That probably can never happen with machines. You know, I'm being a futurist right now, but that's where people are starting to look. And that's why game theory is kind of interesting because it does force you to think about, is there a value decision more than just a decision that you're making? And so as you look at this, that this is where it basically has been, but you know, where are we going in space? So space has been on the journey that everybody else has been on for the last you know, few decades. Uh, it starts with machine learning and machine learning is basically where space is today. So if you think about the 1980s, that's when, space, that's when machine learning really came to fruition. And it's a collection of basically math models that you're looking at a sample set of data and you're making predictions and decisions on that math model but you're having to give the computer the math model. And you'll see the difference of that in a second. So it's a broad field, you know, it gets existed for a lot of years, but this is where you get the personalized new speeds, the traffic predictions. And for us, what you get is storm forecasting. So we look at a math model that basically, here's a bunch of storms, this is how they form, this is what they do. And then we predict your weather forecasts based upon that off of computer models that are basically formed by the National Weather Service and that we re have reside either on our satellites or in our ground systems. But that's sort of a first step of what machine learning is. So most of today, what you see in space is we're trying to make sense of very large data sets. So the weather data, you feed the algorithms a bunch of information about weather that's happened over the last decade. And you try to find and detect patterns in that and try to formulate math models that identify the relationships and create a new prediction model. Um, and potentially de detect anomalies in what happens. So that's where it all started. But what's happened in the last couple of years is something called deep neural networks, which I'm sure many of you know about. This is trying to connect different data sets and trying to connect different input feeds, which would look like somewhat unrelated information and create a greater understanding. Basically the same way a human brain works to network things together. So neural networks are basically algorithms that learn. Um, and they're learning on their own. So they're trending patterns and they basically create their own algorithm for it. So they're actually doing very high math, but they're also creating their own algorithm. The way we use that in space right now is it's what we call finding a needle in a haystack. You may be able to find an image within, within a bigger image. You may be able to find a spectrum that you wanna use, but it's really finding clarity in the midst of noise. And you're trying to have the machine learn itself of what things are and what things aren't. We basically grade its paper and say, yeah, that's, that's not what you think it is. You know, that's not a bus, that's a, that's a big truck. And so you teach it to learn on these things so it can recognize things in an image or a spectrum. This is open spectrum or this is not open spectrum that you can use. It also helps us with where's noise? Is there noise in the spectrum that you can filter out? And we can get the algorithms to help us with that. So associated with deep neural networks, you also get something called deep learning. So deep learning basically is creating that math model for us. And it's an umbrella under, it's the umbrella of machine learning underneath that is deep learning. And so if you look at this and where it's happening, it's basically using a tool to create algorithms on its own. And it's, this is a very important part of what we're trying to do in space because we don't know everything that will happen in space. And so our algorithms have to learn for themselves. They have to be able to be taught and we will grade them. But this is where you get into self-driving vehicles. And for us, self-driving satellites. And then we have to recognize what traffic signs are. And what, you know, if you're driving a self-driven vehicle, you have to recognize traffic signs, voice control, virtual assistance, all the things around you in order to basically have the machine learn what's happening. 
It's the same thing in space. What is happening in space is you have to look around what is happening both within the spacecraft as well as what's happening around it. So we're basically taking the same thing they're doing on automated vehicles and applying that into the space realm for satellites. And so we view though in space, these tools I just went through, machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, as just tools. They're just math problems. It's just like calculus or linear algebra tools. They're basically building blocks to allow us to do other things, applications. And so I'll talk more about the applications as we go. But deep learning and these applications are moving right alongside with this massive expansion that I mentioned in space. The money being infused in space is dramatic. And so there's a lot of money being associated with how do I use these space assets, not just as dumb terminals or simple cameras or picture takers or looking at a piece of weather or weather data, but how do I actually take that and create intelligence out of it? And so that's where we are. And we're at the beginning of that process, basically. So let's talk about how does this apply to space? All right, so first of all, we still use the machine learning neural networks and deep learning. We use that same thing in all the things that we're doing for our advanced problems. So space vehicles, we'll call them, are now becoming autonomous. We call them sometimes satellites. But you know, you're now sensing the environment, which we call situational awareness or space situational awareness. If you're in the Space Force today, that's really important, right? If you're in a warfighting domain, which is where things are moving, this is what's accelerating rapidly right now. If I'm a satellite and I wanna know if some other satellite's around me or some other satellite is trying to disrupt me or some other satellite is, or some even a ground system is trying to disrupt me, I need to know that. And so these algorithms we now have are now sensing their environment. Do I need to move out of the way? Do I need to do something to mitigate somebody who's trying to jam me? It's all the things you've seen in the terrestrial wor world and the air world now being moved to the space world of how do you do that? And so instead of a step-by-step -step recipe that we have within the spacecraft, just doing this command and this command and this command, we're now having algorithms that are actually learning about what is my environment doing and how am I gonna respond? So as you, as you think about doing that, one of the biggest things we have to do is figure out what are the real enablers to that. And right now, one of the biggest enabler problems is what we call computing resources on this slide. And so most satellites, if you remember back, the shuttle was like using a IBM XP computer. It was like really had almost no memory, no computing power. Well, you can't do AI on a satellite or in space if that's the kind of computing power you have. And so I know Cami and others have heard me say, you know, field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs are critical to the future. It is the recipe for the future. We have to have those. We have to have it both in the people who are, know how to program FPGAs as well as new hardware. And so I just, I showed one piece of hardware here, which is the Xilinx Versal chip. The Versal chip is basically being designed by Xilinx to be an AI chip. They're basically creating it so it has the memory, it has the swap, it has all these things that you would want to basically create a very fast processor in space. And at L3 Harris, we're taking that processor and we're radiation hardening it and we're qualifying it for space use because that's the kind of computing power we need. If we can get that kind of computing power, then we can see AI in space really come to fruition. So computing resources was one of the big things we need as you go through space. You, you have to bring the computing power on a spacecraft way up from where it's been. There's a key enabler to see this acceleration you see on this slide. The second piece of it is, is we need data. You know, all these things, deep learning, machine learning, artificial intelligence, all that stuff, big data, if you recall that stuff, it all needs data. And the problem is, is space has a very mixed bag when it comes to the data that's available to it. So if you think about it, we've got to have a data set. It's really important for us to know what that data set is and the quality of that data set. And so right now, what we have in space is you have large data stores. We might've been st storing weather images for the last three decades and are in this big computer database, or you have a situation where you have no real-time data, meaning you're waiting for the satellite to cross above a ground system so it can download its data. So we call that batch or batch processing or batch download. If you think about where the world is going, we need more real-time connectivity to that, those data sources and we need to have the data to be more structured and so that's what's happening in the space world right now is we're trying to build out the infrastructure to allow and enable 
artificial intelligence to actually happen. I don't know if you, many of you will probably remember big data and the term, you know, the five V's, which I have listed here on the slide. You know, the first one was how much data is there to be processed? And so you think about just in the global mobile communication traffic, you know, it was, we were processing in like 2016, we were processing about six exabits. Now in 2020, we have almost 40,000 exabits of data that's coming through. That's not what space looks like, but we do have a lot of data in data stores. And so a lot of people are looking at, what can I do with all that stored data that I've had for years off satellites? Can I use that to make myself more intelligent in the future? The next piece is velocity. How much are we accumulating at any given time of this data? If you think about uh, Google searches, you know, there's three and a half billion searches a day. Facebook increases their number of users by 22% a year. They're accumulating data very fast. Space has a lot of data accumulated, but they don't accumulate it very fast. And so because of that, it makes the data stale in many cases, you know, it's old data. Have you ever looked on Google Earth to see if your house has been updated recently? You, know, you might see a picture of your house, you know, and you can see the car in the driveway that's in 19 or 2015 car because it hasn't taken a picture of your house recently. That's the kind of thing we have. We have a lot of accumulation of data but in many cases it's stale or old in space. So that it doesn't help us a great deal. In terms of variety, um, you get all kinds of data from space. You can get imagery, you can get infrared imagery, you get hyperspectral imagery, you can get spectra, um, signal spectrum. Um, you can get all kinds of data. So it's a very mixed bag. And in the past, we've made no attempt to have anybody make it structured or normalized or in a format that it can be readable. Every satellite's different. So you have a very, very um, interesting data set. In terms of veracity, you know, the question is how much inconsistency or control or quality data is in there? From space, just think about pictures. Some of our pictures have blurry images. Some have cloud cover. Some of them have different things in them that make it very difficult to make a consistent data set and a consistent picture. And so for that in space, it becomes a little more challenging. And the last piece is value. It's kind of like the word problem. You know, what things do you throw out? And what things are really important? And on spacecraft, it's really important to know what's, what's very high value because we're not gonna have infinite computing power. We just can't add another cloud resource for space. What we have to do is basically have a place that we can look at the data and know what do we really, what's really important. And that's where the domain knowledge comes in. And so as I go through this, I'm gonna to try to explain to you, you know, what is, what's important to space? What do we really need to know about? So if I look at where we're going in space, you know, what's happening here? We need four things. Space has to have four things happen for AI to really increase. First is real-time connectivity. Um, it's not here yet, but you're seeing it come. You know, why does Blue Origin, you know, the, the uh, Jeff Bezos company, OneWeb, who's out here at the Cape um, and is now owned by Airbus and SpaceX, what are they doing? They're basically trying to create real-time connectivity. They understand that if these things aren't interconnected and we don't have a network in space, none of this is gonna work. And so there's a ra rapid race to basically create connectivity in space. And so that's number one that we have to have. If you can create that connectivity, then you can get the information back. It's not stale data, it's real-time data. The next is computing power. I've already talked about that, but that's getting the speed of the processor on a satellite faster. We have to have that or you can't even host AI algorithms. It'll, everything will be old data. Everything will be in the past. The next thing that's happening is NOAA and NASA and Space Force and the DOD are creating standards for how satellite imagery and satellite information, it's going to be delivered. They're trying to create universal standards on formatting so that we don't have to deal with such unstructured data. That will help us going forward, but it's a key enabler as we move forward. And then we have to have augmented data sets. And this is something that I think, you know, maybe other people do, but I don't think other industries do it to the level we do it in space. You may have a picture from space of a, a bus and you're at a certain angle, your satellite's looking at the bus from its side, it may have a certain shadowing condition. It may be behind trees or it may have a cloudy day or a sunny day. We're teaching the algorithms by basically creating simulated data. And this is a big emerging field right now. We, there's not a lot of data sets in space, but we can take a look at what does the satellite typically see and then use the computer to generate 
basically a picture, let's say, of the bus from all different angles. And to basically say, okay, if it's, you're at this angle, this is what the bus would look like. If you're at this angle, this is what the bus might look like. On a cloudy day, this is what the bus might look like. And by simulating all that bus information and all that data, we then feed it to these algorithms and say, okay, now learn from this. And it will come back as probability of detect. It will say, well, that's, I think that's a bus. And we go, no, no, that's a truck. And we keep it feeding it the simulated data to make it smarter and smarter to get our probability of detect way up. Because in space, you're not going to get thousands and thousands of images of the, an object from the exact same angle. You're gonna get it from all different angles, all different conditions, all different earth conditions. And so you really need to have the simulated data sets as that's become a really big field for us. So one of the questions always becomes, well, you know, why do you want to do AI in space? Is, you know, is, this, is this important? Should I even care? And the answer is you probably should because space AI has the same challenges as AI on the earth. And it's basically, you know, we have limited connectivity in space. So we need autonomous vehicles. You've got to have autonomous satellites. If we're ever going to make it to the moon, if we're ever going to make it to Mars, if we're going to continue to explore, you know, vehicles have to be autonomous. You can think about, you know, to get to the moon and back, you know, it takes light 2.6 seconds. It can be up to 42 minutes to get to Mars, and it can be you know, more than an hour to get to Jupiter and back. So these vehicles are going to have to have the computational power to learn, to have artificial intelligence, and to continue to figure out how they want to morph themselves requires the speed we talked about. It requires us to really know what's gonna be important. You know, what's just a solar flare and what's something that's actually trying to attack me. All those kinds of things are gonna be important to know what those, how you're gonna teach those algorithms. So I believe today there are a lot of simple problems in space that can be solved by AI now, if we can call it low hanging fruit. But in the long run, we really do need to figure out how are we going to move this forward with the four things I just talked about. So the other places I'd say, is this worth it again? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show my screen um, again, but it's, and I won't fool around trying to make it the full screen, but you can get the basic point. You know, why, are you, why should anybody pay attention to space AI? Is, you know, is it worth it today? You know, today space is about a $300 billion industry. Uh, it's going to a $1 trillion you know, industry in 2040. Um, the other thing that's happening is the billionaires have invaded space. So. You know, people that traditionally, you know, we didn't, we were counting on the government to pay for everything. Now you have a massive amount of commercial money coming in. It's speculated that Jeff Bezos is putting a billion dollars a year into Blue Origin to make space grow. And the way they're looking at it, I think is important because they're looking at it exactly the way I just went through. They believe that if you have the infrastructure, it will open up an entirely new market, an entirely new way to think. You'll hear Bezos quoted about Amazon would not have been possible if we didn't have UPS and FedEx infrastructure. He needed the infrastructure that existed on the terrestrial world to build out Amazon. He's looking at it the same way with space. If he could build out the infrastructure, the connectivity, the power of computing, if he can do that, then it will open up a massive amount of thought process around artificial intelligence and what the art of the possible would be. You think about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, all these people, they have deep interest in AI research because of the space exploration. You think about Elon Musk, his thing is he wants to go to Mars. Bezos wants to create lunar landers and a lunar community. Um, he's thinking about, can I take robots and move them up to space to pre-populate the moon before humans get there? That's where these people are going. They need communication infrastructure. They need AI. They need all these things to learn. If, you're, if I'm gonna land transport ships or basically deliver my Amazon package to the moon, I need to have a lot of AI. So the thing understands what it's getting to, what's the condition on the moon when it lands, where's it going? And that's what these guys are investing in. They're doing a tremendous amount. You know, of course, Branson's looking at having tourism, which you know, again, I, if these weren't billionaires, I would probably laugh it away. But there's, they have enough money and enough crazy thought that they can actually make a difference. And what's happening to them as they go is, they're basically betting their future. This is they're the new pioneers. They're the pioneers of the new world. And so instead of you know hitting the going out west when the pioneers came to the, America, they decided to explore the west. They're looking at space as the place they want to explore, and the enabler of it is artificial intelligence. So I'm going to stop sharing again, but I want to give you some examples and make it practical, as practical as I can. 
about where the kinds of things we're doing in space and the kinds of things we're applying AI to. Remember, for us, AI is a tool. It's just like linear algebra, calculus, mathematics. It's a tool we use to get something that we want on a mission level. And so that's what we're really looking at. So I'm going to start with imagery. We get a lot of imagery. You see it on Google Earth of your house or someplace you want to look. Um, you've seen it after you know, hurricanes. It can give you pre and post information about what an area might have looked like after a hurricane. We use a lot of the imagery data to try to understand our world. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what we're doing on the AI front. Um, one of the things is you know, the needle in the haystack problem. You, know, you remember the old, you know, if you've ever got the Highlights magazine, it shows how old I am. But the Highlights magazine, you had to find all the little special things in the picture. In many cases, these images are very difficult. We take pictures of you know, 100 um, nautical miles across. And so they just look like a bunch of dots. But a algorithm can go in and really find the things it wants to find, you know, what is really happening. And so you're teaching the algorithm to detect features, or we're teaching the algorithm to detect shapes. And that can come from the optical imagery, you know, picture. It can come from spectral. The spectral will give you the emissions and sort of the signature of the object you're looking at. And then hyperspectral, I usually call it the fingerprints. It can tell you specifically what's happening. And so you mix all those together, this, these different types of imagery, and you can actually identify things. So you can identify if somebody's developing a weapon of mass destruction by looking at the signature of what's happening on a building. You can look at finding planes. You can look at finding all kinds of different things. And that's what we're using AI for a lot in the imagery area. And again, we're teaching it with simulated data. The second one we're looking at from imagery is really to predict hurricanes and natural disasters. This is a safety thing. So if you think about the 10-day forecast, have you ever looked at that you know, on your weather application and you go, well, 10 days out, that's not very accurate. Well, we're trying to make it more accurate by taking all that weather data and making the forecast more accurate and taking a look at what other things can we learn, what things are normal, what's are abnormal, what, what are triggers and mathematical models that will help us get smarter. The other thing we found um, off a couple of our satellites, so we have a couple satellites that we have that look at the ocean and, uh, and take a look, but we have found people stranded at sea. Um, and so that makes us feel good that we actually were able to go out there and find people and rescue them. But we are using the algorithms to look at, okay, that's a wave. That's, this is what a normal ship looks like. And this is an abnormal behavior. This is an abnormal thing that we see in the image. And so we've been able to find people and find people who may be you know, leaving Cuba and coming to the US or they're stranded out at sea, they're just drifting. We've been able to use these algorithms to actually save people. And that, again, makes us feel pretty good. We've also used the same thing for planes that are struggling and have gone down. So we're looking a lot at you know, what can what does a normal plane look like? What kind of signals is it putting off? You know, what kinds of beaconing is it doing? And when it's different, can we highlight it to someone and get people to rescue um, airplanes or boats? Another thing we're using it for a lot is crop health. When we look at crops and we, you know, we can see when a, a beetle or something is starting to eat at a crop, many times people can't see it, but from space, you have a very unique perspective. You can look down on it, you can basically teach the algorithm to know where is that crop struggling. Um, one of the interesting ones we found was you can do find where hot spots are. So in the wildfires out west, we can show from space, this is a spot that looks like it's starting to have a fire and we can tell people where to go and find that fire and basically fight the fire so it doesn't get out of control so fast. You know, it was one of the things we did because it came off our weather satellite that did that. We also started to look at can we do something different with that technology? What we found is, um, it was about three years ago, four years ago, one of our weather satellites picked up a very bright fire on the east coast of Florida, right around Cape Canaveral. And it sent us a warning that said, there is a very hot spot on the east coast of Florida. It's traveling very fast across the Atlantic Ocean and somebody ought to go deal with it. And in essence, we had picked up a launch. We had picked up the launch of a rocket from the, uh, from the coast of Florida. And it allowed us to realize our weather sensors actually could track missiles as well. And recently we've won a couple of big missile warning jobs because we've taken that sensor, reprogrammed it. This is going to a different domain and, and reprogrammed the algorithms that we were using to track fires to now track missiles. So it's, it's basically taking the exact artificial intelligence and using it a different way. We also use it, you know, I think many of you all probably know we use it to classify space objects. We found new, two new planets. We're taking a boatload of information 
and figuring out what's a real planet, what's a false planet, what's the trajectory, and so it learned from it. Um, and so as you think about going forward, if the NOAA satellites, the weather satellites, we only actually use about two to 3% of the data coming off that satellite. The rest of it's thrown away or put in a data store. So we're looking at now, could we increase that to make our, the accuracy of our forecast better? But you think about all that data that's currently thrown away, AI could potentially make it useful. I mentioned spectrum, you know, the spectrum management, if you will. It's the same thing I mentioned before. We're looking for open frequencies. We're looking for hidden signatures, faint signals. AI can help us with that. And the area that's really starting to take off is robots. Robots in space, autonomous vehicles in space. You saw SpaceX do the Simon robot, which was the crew interactive mobile companion is basically helping uh, people, all scientists on the space station do their work. So you saw that and that's like, okay, if you can do that kind of robot, what else can they do? You saw SpaceX, you know, if you remember Apollo 13, the movie, of course I've watched it a hundred times and I'm like, I always get tense around the part where they're trying to dock, you know, the two vehicles together. Well, they don't have to do that anymore because everything's artificial intelligence and so they just let go and let the thing automatically dock. So unfortunately we don't have the same tension anymore if, you, if you're a space person like me, but it's, it's very safe now because we've used artificial intelligence. And lastly, you know, a lot of our satellites today are tip and cue, which means they see something and they react to it. So they may look for patterns of life. They may look for is somebody trying to jam me. They may look for abnormal behaviors that will tip the satellite to do something different, to either protect itself, to go do something else, get on a different frequency. But that's where the space force is going. A lot of tipping and queuing. What am I seeing in my environment? So I'm gonna end up with, you know, long-term, I'm gonna basically go off and say, okay, I'm gonna be a futurist for a couple minutes and then we'll wrap up and I'll open up for questions. But, you know, a lot of these things I would have thought were crazy, except I got three billionaires sitting in the space market that are making it all happen. And so we're gonna to continue to refine what we're already doing, you know, trending in data. But what you're seeing now is fully autonomous, fully controlled operations of vehicles. Um, reusable vehicles, uncrewed vehicles to the moon. How can I pre-populate the moon with all this equipment that humans are gonna arrive way before humans actually arrive? You're seeing Blue Moon, basically, it's a part of you know, Blue Origin that is trying to figure out how could they actually deliver Amazon packages to the moon. And again, those things sound kind of crazy, but the way things are going, it's going pretty fast. The other futuristic is space is a warfighting domain. The Space Force is real. It's highly supported on, by both Democrats and Republicans. And it's basically, how am I gonna protect these space assets? I started with space is critical and th therefore those assets are critical. Um, we're getting into policy questions about if I jam somebody's satellite, is that an act of war? Because space is so critical to us as a human race and as Americans, we have to protect those assets. And Space Force is looking really heavily at how do we protect them? How do we react to what's happening? Um, and lastly, you know, I, I just wanna to touch on the education part. And that is, we are training people completely differently in the workforce now. So we have developed internally to our company an internal deep learning short course that people go through when we're onboarding them into our company. And it's everybody from executives all the way to the experts in AI, because we want them to understand both the terminology and how to apply it. Because AI is gonna become such an integral part, an integral tool for our future, we wanna make sure everybody knows about it. So the first part is just terminology and understanding the applications. The next one is, is basically starting to teach people to be technicians of it, to be able to operate on the data sets. And then we have, of course, experts and a whole group that actually basically focuses on the tools and how to apply them. So again, AI is, is a tool. It affects every part of our business. I just happen to be talking about space, but we're really trying to make it a broader part of our our base. It's, it's kind of like the digital technologies that are coming in right now, a digital thread and uh, digital twins and those kind of things, which we could talk about. But it's, it's another tool in the toolbox that is really going to transform our future. So, I mean, I'm going to pause here, but it's, you know, we remain focused really on these pillars of machine learning and deep learning, but it's really an exciting time in space. So I, I hopefully I've teed up enough topics that it's, it was of interest to you. And now again, I'll open it up to any questions people might have about where we're headed. Thank you, Bill, for that fascinating presentation. If you have a question, please put it in the chat, type it in the chat, and I will relay it to Bill. While we're waiting for some folks to get their questions teed up, Bill, I have a question for you. Sure. One of the concerns that I've heard about AI is the need to develop systems to provide what in a traditional system we call verification and validation. 
Do you have any insights into how BNB can be provided in an AI system? Yeah, it's, what we're doing right now, especially in space, because of space is a warfighting domain, people are spoofing the data just like they would uh, different kinds of imagery. So we are looking at triggers inside the data that would tell you that it's been modified or in some way it is not from its original source. And so we're looking at basically what are the, what are the triggers and you have to do a trace back almost. You have to do a trace back of where did the data come from and how did it get to you? And so you, we're really trying to make sure that the data integrity is very high. Um, it is a, it, to be honest, it's a very challenging problem for us right now. There are many different organizations trying to look at it because we're worried about people spoofing it. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the, actually, it's one of the challenges of should the government own their asset or should they get their data from commercial sources? If it's from commercial sources and somebody has a cyber attack and they get in there and modify the data, can the government really count on it? Can they really use that uh, for the Space Force or not? And so that's where it's getting to. It's, it's almost policy and how good can we make it? So it's a very good question. It's a very difficult question for a lot of people right now. Um, but it is one of those where it's the reason why the government will always own some set of satellites to do cross-reference. So one of our questions has come in, our GPS systems are so critical. How are we protecting these assets? So one of the biggest things that we do on GPS, it's called the OCX, is the ground station and both and also the satellite. We're making it almost impenetrable to cyber attack. So it can be jammed. I mean, that is possible. In fact, it's easier than you would imagine to jam, but we're making it so that it can't be cyber attacks. We cyber hardened it. And actually in GPS, we took it from basically from the, the design itself and we built in cyber protections all the way from the original design. We didn't try to band-aid it with, you know, putting a tool around it. We basically built inside it different checks and balances. Things like what I just talked about on authenticity. Did that code change from yesterday? Did we see anything that actually modified the code? Is the code the exact same? Is it operating the same? We're putting it in ASICs, which of course, you know, you're not as reprogrammable. So we have something that's a standard. So yeah, we're protecting it very heavily, um, but we're also looking for workarounds in case it gets jammed. They, it is very susceptible to jamming, uh, GPSs. So if you're getting jammed, can you have other paths that you get the GPS signal to where it needs to go? And so that's a big field right now in space alternate GPS as we call it. There's a question from a potential uh, employee in AI. What positions are available in AI? Can we as uh, BS mechanical engineering graduates move into positions of AI without further education? What do you recommend taking to become valuable in an AI degree? So a couple of things. One, yes, you can do it without having a background in data science. If you, you know, we will train you. You're in a a unique position right now because industry understands that there's a lot of people in electrical and mechanical that have basic skills that we believe we can retool. But the strength that we look for is how much math have you had? How did you do in the math courses? How did you do in linear, linear algebra? How did you do in you know, vector algebra? And all those kind of things, because those are the tools you're gonna have to use. And so the other thing that we like is if you're a mechanical engineer, did you take software courses? Did you, are you, how familiar are you, are you with it? It doesn't preclude you from having those roles, um, but those are things that would accelerate you. Computer science, a deeper math background, um, and those things are very helpful. The reality is, is what I said before, you know, these are tools, just like calculus. We need people who can translate. Translation is the biggest thing, right? Can I translate this tool into something that really is applicable? And so if you're a person that has that creativity, we'll train you. And you can send your resume to me. Build up all at l3airs.com because we are desperate for people. <laughs> we have a couple of questions around the sort of ethical and responsible side of AI. The first one is thinking about ethics of data graduated on people, such as the example of individuals engaged in any activity. What are the privacy concerns? Yeah, so this is a, a big deal. Now, it's, it's not as, um, you know, I always think about somebody running a little drone and they bring their drone up and they take it over to my house and they look down and see what I'm doing in my pool. It's like, okay, well, you, that's a privacy concern. Stop doing that. We have the same problem in space, right? We're taking pictures of people's lives and without necessarily any uh, rules. Now, there are rules that we've put in place policy-wise that you cannot take imagery and use it of American citizens. You cannot uh, tap 
phone calls of American citizens. You can't do those things from space and you can't do it actually at all in the government. But there's the commercial side, which that's, that data exists. And so I think at some point it goes from the really extreme, which is what do you consider an act of war? If I jam your satellite or I stop your communication, like when they had the uprisings and the Arab uprisings, and we decided as a country that we we're gonna stop all the communication in and out of those Arab countries where there was massive uprisings, is that an act of war or not? You then go back to a personal warranty, personal privacy acts. And those will be fought in the courts, to be honest. It is, it is just starting as a field. And I know I've talked to the Dean about this, about you know, having these things connected between these different colleges is important because what we do in engineering is becoming so dramatic for our world. It does have policy concerns. I know the Dean's got a lot of connections here. We are trying to make those connections because of how important it is. We don't have all the answers yet, but it's, it's coming pretty fast. This is a sort of a related question. How do you define responsible AI and what responsible AI frameworks are you incorporating into your development? You know, this is, this is one that I would say is a, a value set for different people in different companies. For many years, we as a company did not build offensive weapons because we just didn't think that that was what the responsible company would be doing for the way we were doing it. We now do. Um, and so your, your values and things change over time. I think this is, um, we're getting into, again, the, the policy and what you're willing to do. Um, some people won't come to work for a company that actually does things like offensive weapons and things like that. Those get down to very personal value sets. Um, I think that you, what we're going to see is a more clarification of who does what. So if you're dealing with the Space Force, you are building offensive weapons. You will spy on people you will take the data, you will do things with cross lines that some people will say, no, I don't want to do that. But what we, you need to, but hopefully it'll be decided. What was a problem was like with Google, when they said, oh, we're going to enable the government to do these spy, that's when their workforce freaked out because they said, well, that's not who we are. So I think it's going to become very clear about this type of industry. You don't have to be part of it. But this type of industry is going to do this kind of work. This type of industry is going to do a different kind of work. And you're going to find the friendly AI and you're going to find the AI that does war fighting. And you're going to get to decide on a personal basis which one do you want to be a part of. So I think that's the segregation that's going to start happening. That's the tension you're going to see pulling. Um, a question here about how AI systems for space are tested and qualified. They're such expensive assets that you need certainty that they will work before you put them into space. You know, it's interesting that you say that because we're seeing a lot more experimentation in space than we ever have. There's a new breed in space. And it's really the reason why we're growing. We call it responsive space, which is we're, we're basically able to do test beds. And so it's not the, everything has to be perfect and then I'm gonna upload it to the spacecraft anymore. That's not the way people want it. They want experimentation. They want faster, just like we do on earth, right? But space has had to train, change its mentality because of the mentality has been, it's oh, it gotta work, it's gotta be conservative. That's changing and it's left opportunities for like our company. We just won two huge missile defense contracts or we wouldn't even been considered for those five years ago because we weren't the incumbent. We weren't the big conservative company, but we're viewed as this new person getting in there. And so what you're seeing is now, and it's the reason why I keep telling the Dean, have an FPGA group because they're field programmable. You know, you, you can reprogram them. You, you wanna have a standard that you can always fall back on sort of your reset button on your computer. Oops, so I go back to its original settings. But we're doing a lot more field programmable gate arrays because you can experiment, you can try things, you can load things, and it's giving us a lot more flexibility. That's the way this is accelerating right now. Same thing with AI. We're gonna put AI, AI things on there. And as I said, we're gonna grade its paper. We're gonna say, okay, you went off and did that, and I send your paper back down just like you do a student. You, know, you got this one wrong and this one wrong, but this is the ones you got right. Good for you. Do more of those and do less of the previous ones question is from a former Harris employee. Uh oh. Do you see using AI as a tool for the mission planning aspect of the ground system for a satellite constellation? The mission planning portion. Um, potentially. I mean, it, again, it depends on right now we're trying to get more universal ground systems so that we're not just having one ground system. And in that case, you want it to learn. So if I'm talking to a weather satellite and I use that same ground station to talk to a signal satellite or an imagery satellite, you want it to be able to quickly reprogram itself and know what's important in each. 
And so, yes, we are looking at it very heavily. On the weather side, you know, NASA and NOAA and others are looking at the weather world and saying, we're not using enough AI. We have got to take, we have, like I said, we're, we're dropping 95% of the data on the floor right now. And so they don't have the compute resources and space to do it. So it's basically change the ground, use these AI techniques to change how ground is being done. And so there's a massive investment going in right now. And again, as, as you saw the change of administration, climate's coming back. So we don't have enough computing resources and space to do climate. It's gonna be AI taking space data down and AI on the ground system to architect where we go forward. Question is about uh, investments in space by other countries. Your presentation focused on the big three investments in space. What are the other investors, i.e. countries up to? So, yeah, you know, certainly the Japanese and that portion of the, country, the world they want their own systems. So they may want their own, you know, South Korea wants their own GPS system. Uh, Japan wants their own weather systems. Um, anybody that's close to China wants their own observation system, you know, regional observation so they can know what's happening and what China's doing. So all that area is mostly of getting basic GPS, getting good weather satellites, and then protection, what we call intelligence reconnaissance and surveillance systems. In Europe, you're seeing them reconstitute their GPS systems. You're seeing them take a look at it. With Brexit, you saw the UK start to say, I'm gonna invest in it in my own GPS system. Many of them are investing in communication systems. They want their own dedicated communication system. They don't want to allow, I'll say the US to do what we did in some countries, which is we'd lock them out. So we turned off their, their spigot for communications. They wanna have control. And many countries are actually looking at it as national pride. They're coming out and saying, you know, all the really cool countries have a space thing. And so I'm going to create a space organization. And, you know, it works for us because we get to sell more. But it's, it's interesting that they view that as sort of a first world nation kind of calling card and badge of I have a space thing. So I, therefore, I've arrived. I'm not a third world country anymore. And so we get a lot of the national pride stuff as well. So it's really comms, GPS, weather or you know, imagery and then protection of ISR. And every place across the globe, including Africa, is starting to look at this. I mean, they, they all want something. The one thing that's unique about space is you don't have boundaries as much. So you can be looking at somebody from a long ways away and you're not, you don't have to get approval necessarily easily. Now, there are policies. I don't want to say it's just a free-for-all up there, but you have a lot more flexibility to do what you want to do in space than you do on bringing tanks into somebody's country or something crazy like that. In addition to AI, what additional technology area investments should UF make to continue its growth as a national leader in astronautical sciences? You know, the, one of the biggest things that's happening right now is digital, the whole digital transformation, going from individual tools that are disconnected to connecting them all, which we call digital thread. The other piece of it is, is digital twins. So you might build a piece of hardware and you might build, I might build a satellite and I might build different kinds of ground systems, but can I build it in the digital domain? such that I can model it and know how it's gonna react and basically take everything that's hardware related and make, put it in the virtual digital domain. So that's, that's a massive effort right now. It's, it's probably as big as AI right now in terms of what is happening. Um, companies are literally investing hundreds of millions of dollars to make this digital transformation so that if they wanna try something out, they don't have to go and build it. They can actually do it in the computer virtual realm. And that's why Amazon Web Services some of these things that spin up huge amounts of resources are so powerful these days because we can spin up entire satellite systems in the virtual world and, and learn how they operate digitally. And then we can take the resources down once we finish our thing. If we had to build a spacecraft, like a mock spacecraft, it'd be a long time and it'd be very, very expensive. So we're trying to move over to the digital realm and that, that is a massive investment that's happening. You'll hear that out of, you know, Will, if you haven't heard Will Roper out of the DOD, he's one that talks a lot about everything's got to go to digital twin, which just means you have to have a digital representation of anything you're building in hardware. So it's a lot of money going there. Could you comment on the problem of space debris and what role AI might play in cleaning up our orbital lanes? So space debris is a big deal. Uh, we're creating a lot of space debris. You know, there was a period of time a while back where people accidentally ran into satellites and created a bunch of shrapnel. Um, and it, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to say that those things are on purpose or not on purpose, but we have a big problem with space debris. You know, AI, we track over 27,000 pieces of space debris that are near earth. 
um, right now. The question is, how do you actually solve the problem? And that's a much more difficult problem. It's more on the science realm, actually. It's, you know, do you charge the particles somehow to get them to clump together since they fall to earth faster? Do you have a big net that cleans them all up? Do you, you know, how, how do you do it? That's where it becomes a very challenging environment. We all know it exists. There are times, for example, we can't launch in a launch window because if you did, you'd run into a piece of space debris. So we have to have artificial intelligence constantly telling us where is all that debris and make sure we can weave through it. Um, people worry a lot about the small satellites that they will become space debris because they die earlier and they don't have um, the ability to get themselves out of the way or burn up in the atmosphere. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem as you think of all these thousands of satellites that are now being launched. Will they become debris? Um, you know, it's, we, we'd like to joke, and we're going to darken the sky with all this debris at some point. You won't be able to see the sun for all the space debris. <laughs> But the reality is we don't have a great solution for it right now, but AI does help us to know how to not hit it or to tell someone, hey, you, this is how the debris is moving. This is how the debris cloud's moving. You need to make a maneuver so you don't hit it. You'll hear that out of the space shuttle too. I'm, you know, this, I'm sorry, space station. You got to move. <laughs> you don't want to hit something you know, because it's, it's a lot of debris up there right now. And it's getting worse. So if you have an idea, we'd love to hear it. And we can probably <laughs> we'll fly it for you. <laughs> How can the industry encourage states like Florida to encourage more AI or AI supportive curricula for schools to teach students both on the secondary and post-secondary level? Um, so a lot of what it is, is, you know, at the end, I think the board of advisors with Dean Abernathy, you know, we, at various times we have gone to the state and, and made a play for this. And I think these are kind of areas, certainly as UF has gotten to be a preeminent leader in AI right now, are things we ought to take a look at. Should we go as a group? I mean, I think the Dean can tell you. When we go individually, just the UF or she goes up there and talks to people, it, 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 that's interesting, but not as interesting as if a series of industry partners goes at the same time. So I think it's a partnership and you know, we want it, we tell people that, but we are not as dependent on state funding as somebody like a university might be. And so a lot of times we have to be prodded. You know, it might have to be a little poking of the industry to say, hey, this is important to the state because we as a company are looking at a you know, much broader market, but we're more than willing to do it. And certainly we are also investing. So a lot of, I know we have the short course that we've helped with, uh, with UF, but those are things we invest in, but it really requires a coalition, if you will. You, know, you don't get there just by one person going up there. It's a coalition partnering between universities and industry and saying this is important. And you and, and Harris in general have been tremendous partners with us in those endeavors. So thank you both. Well, there've been several questions dealing with regulation of AI. Can you comment on the status of national or international agreements that are in place to regulate the use of AI? You know, we're at a very infant level, um, very early level. There's very little out there that's regulating it. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where typically regulations come because mistakes are made. Um, and that's just my, that's a personal view. It's not like a universal, I, I view it, you know, we have a lot of policies, and a lot of rules because somebody messed up. I think what you're going to find is as you get personal um, privacy lawsuits coming against certain things, you'll see more rules come in place. We have a device, which I hate to bring up, but we have a device that actually police can use. It's a police scanner that can find um, cell phones of people and can find the number. And, and it's, it has been questionable over time. People, we've gotten in the news media because are you really using that thing for good or for evil? You know, because we're not allowed to spy on American citizens. And it's, it's those kind of things. Once it gets in the media and people get excited about it, then you're gonna see a policy come out. Right now, it's, it's pretty much um, the wild west when it comes to some of this stuff. We don't have a lot of policies in place. There are people starting to think about it, but to be honest, more people are enthralled with the benefits of AI than they are of creating the constraints today. Again, it's usually a mistake that's made or something that is, people find it abhorrent to the big O, that, that should not have happened. That's when you start to see the policies come in. And we really haven't had that yet. But as we enable it, you will start to see it. You mentioned standards uh, during your presentation about uh, data formats and what have you. One question is about who's driving that. Is it organizations like IEEE or, or government organizations like NASA or, or someone else, NIST? It's NOAA, NASA, and the DoD. It's, it's really coming out of the Department of Defense is a real big leader on it. They're tired of basically having all these different formats that don't talk to each other. 
And if you think you're a battle, you think you're a warfighter, and you have to go to 15 different computers to get a few, you know, a couple pieces of data to paste them together. They're just so frustrated with it. They just they've had it. So they are not allowing any new any new programs to come unless you use the standard formats. They're just they just had it. <laughs> so this will probably be the last question okay. in the interest of time. Um, one questioner asked about. Uh, there was a, a list of 10 principles of ethics in AI that were published in China in 2019. Are you familiar with those? Are those something that the U.S. is considering as well? I, I'm familiar with them. I do not know if the U.S. Is, is modeling it. I do know that it has been looked at. Again, it's it's one of those where people are starting, that is, that is an infant industry or infant initiative to try to address it. It is a very challenging aspect of this whole thing. You know, it's, again, it's what... It goes along, and I hate to balance this, but the one that's coming to mind is you know, cloning or using cells, all those things, you know, you can see this great benefit, but then it's got this weird policy, personal privacy issue. So again, right now, most of us are just running as fast as we can to, to actually have it do good. You know, I, the one thing in my motto for our business is, you know, we provide insights for a better world. It's not insights to destroy things. It's insights for a better world, so we're all better. And you know, we all get more intelligent. We all have a better life. And I think is that that's where there are people who will use it for nefarious reasons. And when they do, it's going to create all kinds of policy issues. So I, don't, I wish I had all the crystal ball on that one, but it's, it's a tough one. It's going to evolve over time. So lawyers are going to make a lot of money. It'll be good for them. As always. <laughs> exactly. So somebody will be making the money. Bill, one common theme through all of the questions has been uh, what an excellent presentation this was. And I, I concur completely. Thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, we will be hosting another webinar in March and we'll be in touch with those details fairly soon. Thanks, Thanks again for joining us and go Gators. Thanks for having me.